So thank you everybody for joining us. We um, are here today to talk about renesting wildlife. Do you guys see the just the screen? Yep, it looks perfect. Slideshow. You don't see any pictures of people. <laughs> okay, perfect. Perfect. All right. So uh, renesting wildlife. How and when to reunite wildlife babies with their parents? Um, this is the perfect time of year. Uh, it is. No, it feels like summer outside. It is springtime for uh, wildlife in South Florida and around the country. And babies are literally falling out of trees everywhere. So this is a good way to kind of um, help wildlife. And it is one of the best ways to help wildlife, um, especially in our urban areas. Um, so why reuniting versus rehabilitation? So finding wildlife is can happen anywhere um, on your way to your car, in your backyard gardening, um, on your way into your office building, anywhere. Um, you may be finding wildlife these days. Um, and instinct is to help it. No matter who you are, whether you're an avid animal lover, your natural instinct is always to, to help wildlife. Uh, but there is a choice you have to make um, off the bat. Are you going to just immediately pick it up, take it home? Or are you going to try to solve the problem, you know, uh, on the spot? And we all live in busy lives and we all have somewhere to go, but taking a couple of extra minutes can really help wildlife um, by just reuniting it with its parents. Some reasons, um, the best reasons to reunite wildlife and obviously always healthy wildlife back to with its parents is mother knows best. Um, and we mean that for all species, mothers do know best. Uh, we, we have done rehab for so long now that we have been able to um, collect data to, to see survivability. And really, mother raises her child better than any human can. Um, natural behaviors are learned through uh, observing the parents. So when the babies are in the nest, um, whichever kind of nest they are in, they're observing their parents the moment they open their eyes. And they're learning natural behaviors, how to preen themselves, how to groom, how to maintain their feathers or their fur, how to um, eat. You know, if they're predators, they are observing their parents shredding the food and how to cast pellets, things that, that we as humans would never be able to teach uh, wildlife. They get a more diverse diet, uh, you know, with, with rehabilitation. Uh, diets are very limited. We are only able to produce or purchase a certain amount of diets, but within the wild community, they are able to forage a variety of bugs. Dinner is never always the same. Uh, so they get a more nutritious vitamin balance uh, through, through a diverse wild diet through mom, um, which helps for growing bones, better vision, um, just like it does for humans, you know, better diet does provide for a healthier body. Um, nutritional milk for our mammals, uh, though synthetic milks uh, have come a long way in the rehabilitation process. Um, mother's milk still provides a variety of nutrition that is age appropriate. The studies have shown that the milk in mother's uh, mammals milk changes from newborn to um, all the way into the waning uh, days of nursing for, for all of our mammals. Whereas human uh, manufactured formula kind of stays the same, we either dilute it or not, but it, it doesn't um, vary as much. Um, mothers provide round the clock care for their offspring. Um, humans do have time limitations. We do clock in and clock out. We're less likely to be there around the clock to, to provide comfort and feeding. Ex also exposure to other species uh, as our wildlife are in trees, in their dens, there are other species flying around, crawling inside. Uh, that exposure to other species, the species permits those babies to learn who is a friend and who is a foe by their parents' behaviors. And also exposure to natural cycles weather, the wind blowing, leaves uh, fluttering in the trees, things like that permits uh, offspring to learn natural cues about sunrise and sunset. Rehabilitation does its best, but there are so many limitations. So 
reuniting wildlife with ba- uh, wildlife with their wild parents is always best. So we're going to kind of break it down. Um, the most abundant uh, species we see at Pelican Harbor is um, a- birds, aves. Uh, columbiforms, variety um, of doves and pigeons native to South Florida. Uh, they can nest twice a year um, and they can have large clutches. Uh, so it does provide a huge amount of babies every season. Uh, songbirds, including blue jays, mockingbirds, grackles, and fish crows are probably the loudest of the birds you hear in your backyard. And they do sometimes produce two um, sets of babies every season if mother is experienced and if she starts early. And then uh, finally, shorebirds uh, like ducks, terns, and herons also nest down here in South Florida. And there are a large variety of those, both migratory and native to South Florida. Each one of the species um, has a specific varied diet uh, and specific style of nesting and time um, and amount of time that they stay with parents. Uh, Next in our bird categories are our raptors. Um, There are small, medium and large raptors here in South Florida. Um, The main ones that we see and we try to re-nest are Eastern screech owls, barn owls, barred owls, great horned owls. And for our larger hawks and raptors uh, are our Cooper's hawks, red shoulder hawks, red tailed hawks and American bald eagles. Our raptors can take a a lot of time. Um, These predators are, they have a rapid growth um, stage in their development where they have to be fed around the clock um, about some of them every one to two hours for several stages of their development. That is very taxing um, on both mom and rehabilitators uh, to, to be able to provide that care. And like I said, that nutrition uh, plays a key role on their development. It permits their feathers to grow and uh, develop appropriately to have that precision flight that uh, provides survivability for them in the wild. Um, Then we have our mammals, um, though less, uh, less seen at Pelican Harbor, They are a huge amount of phone calls. Um, We receive a large amount of phone calls at Pelican Harbor about um, orphaned mammals like our raccoons, foxes, and now um, coming into play are coyotes that have migrated down into South Florida. Uh, Those can have anywhere from two to six um, for those large mammals, babies in a, for one mom in one season. So uh, oftentimes if a mother is trapped or lost um, uh, to to predation, uh, that does cause a lot of extra work on a wildlife rehabilitation center. And for our small mammals, we have gray squirrels, marsh rabbits, and cottontails. Now I did not include um, Virginia opossums in anywhere in that list. Um, because those are not an animal that can be re-nested because of mom's marsupial pouch. See if she loses a baby, um, if one just falls out of the pouch because she was scared by a dog and she ran off. Um, uh, Virginia opossums are the one mammal that we are not able to re-nest. Uh, so it does cause uh, a bit of a problem if mom does lose that baby. So that those babies automatically have to go to a wildlife rehabilitation center. So let's say you found a baby. You are walking around in your backyard um, and you find a baby. The first thing you should always do is observe. Um, Before you approach, maybe before you pick up, um, just observe, kind of back off and see, is there going to be a mom coming down? Um, maybe it was a cat that brought it and you scared it off. Um, that would definitely paint a a pretty important picture for you. Uh, so before you, you make any moves, just stand back and observe. Don't pick anything up. Don't, don't make any, um, assumptions. Uh, once you're observing, do you notice any blood? Are there is blood on the face, um, on the, on the tail, on the feathers that'll generally indicate if, um, 
if there was either um, another animal interaction that was negative, either a cat or a hawk, um, or sometimes even a dog, uh, immediately at that point, you would want to call and bring in that patient to a wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, do you see any parasites like ants or fleas, flies buzzing around it? That is, a, that is a big flag that that animal has been there for a while um, and is in desperate need for some help. Um, what, if the um, what if it was in the mouth of an animal, any other animal, that other than its parent, parent animal, being in the mouth of another animal is often a big flag that there is something deeply wrong and that animal has to be brought in. Um, and are there any physical or vocal activities with the baby? Do you see the baby is holding its head up, um, trying to move, get out of the sunlight, vocalizing, calling for a parent? Uh, if the animal, the baby is quiet, that's a, that's a pretty bad side, uh, sign. Um, most babies, if they are not in the care of their parent, are quite vocal. Um, the only time babies are really quiet, and if anybody's had a baby, um, is when they're well-fed and sleeping. That's the only time any species baby is kind of quiet. So a quiet baby definitely is a sign. Now, if you observe your, your baby and you do notice that it's a lot of these red flags are coming up, just call a wildlife center. Um, Pelican Harbor has a great, um, team that we assist you, we communicate, talk you through the whole process. So if you do see blood and parasites, or you did see a cat run off, um, and drop that baby, you want to, you want to call immediately. Uh, if you see any bones, call immediately. Um, if you do notice that the weather is turning as we're going into our hurricane season or stormy weather, uh, storms can definitely play a big factor on why animals are orphaned or left behind. Um, the stormy weather can sometimes knock the nests out of a tree. They can sometimes, um, you know, shake things up. It's not always an indication that an animal needs to be brought indoors to a wildlife facility, but sometimes it just indicates that we should maybe wait for the storm to pass before we attempt our re-nest. So we always wanna make sure that we call to make sure that our, um, if we are gonna hold on to it for the storm to pass before we attempt to replace it, uh, place it back in its nest, we wanna make sure that we're doing this proper steps uh, until, until it's re-nested. Um, if we re-nest it or bring it in, the animal seems healthy, you want to try to re-nest it. So if everything seems fine, the animal's vocal, there is nothing wrong, we want to attempt to re-nest it um, as soon as possible. So one of the species we see the most around here, and I'm gonna go through the three most common species that we re-nest. So, one of them is our beloved gray squirrel. Um, they are quite adorable, but they take a lot of time to raise. Uh, depending on the age that uh, gray squirrels um, brought into the Pelican Harbor, it can take anywhere from one to, to three months to raise a baby squirrel. Uh, so it's very time consuming, very taxing on the staff. Um, and like I said, it's not always the best for the patient. They're not learning um, how to be a successful gray squirrel in the wild um, as well as they would if they were with their mother. So if you do find a gray squirrel at pretty much whatever age, it's a, the same process. You want to do the first step, which is observing. Now you've established that the squirrel is able to be re-nested. You are gonna place that healthy gray squirrel even if it has a fluffy tail or not, you wanna place that healthy gray squirrel directly on the ground. So you do not wanna put it in a box, don't put it in a towel, don't put anything that would scare mom off. You wanna place that baby right on the ground, back where you found it, as close as possible. That squirrel mom knows where she left her baby. 
they are good mothers. They have already invested a lot of effort into that baby. There's no good reason that they would step away from that baby. So play that, place that squirrel on that ground right next to where you found it. And you are going to go to your phone and play the gray squirrel distress call. You can find that on YouTube. Uh, and the link is here uh, in blue. If you uh, later on when they post this, you'll be able to access it. I would play that as loud as I can uh, on our cell phone and place it near the squirrel. Not directly on it, but near the squirrel. That will, you will play that uh, uh, several times and mother typically comes running down immediately and retrieves her baby. Uh, I have a question. Would a squirrel distress call alert a raptor? Uh, I've never had that incident with a raptor being um, uh, alerted. Typically the human presence kind of deters the raptor from coming in. Um, and often what happens is uh, every time I've re-nested a baby squirrel using the distress call, mom comes down immediately. Um, and raptors are not sitting uh, in our trees, just you know, kind of waiting for a squirrel to pop down. Uh, they're kind of just flying around and being opportunistic, maybe chasing something out of a tree. But great question. Um, all right, so. What you want to do is play that audio as close to that squirrel as possible and step away. You want to be at a close enough distance where you can observe maybe a parked car nearby, um, but you don't want to be directly on top of that squirrel. Mom is most likely watching in a tree and waiting for you to step away to come retrieve her baby. Now, I understand that most of us, uh, you know, if we find a squirrel, it might be at a public place like a park, a city park, or maybe on the front of our sidewalk with a lot of cars going by. So this sometimes may take a couple of tries. As long as your baby is healthy, as long as your baby is vocal and moving around, this is a great option. We want to also make sure that we never, ever feed a baby squirrel. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't do that for several reasons. We wanna keep that baby hungry. We wanna keep that baby calling for mom, very active, really desperate to be reunited with mom. Uh, if we kind of satiate that need, if we calm that baby down, then what might happen is mom's just not gonna be as active and coming down for her baby because that baby won't be as desperate for, for mom's attention. Um, and also we don't wanna feed that baby the wrong food or for it to, um, get fed in the wrong way that it, the food might go into the lungs. So we want to really make sure that we leave that baby hungry as possible and uh, let mom feed him or her when she retrieves them. Uh, okay. The next slide. Uh, um, for our next uh, most common is our cup nesters. Our, our example of our cup nesters would be a dove like you see in this morning dove, uh, we wanna locate, oops, sorry about that. All right, so what we are gonna try to do with our cub nesters is locate the original nest. Perhaps um, a sibling, sibling bumped the baby out of the nest or perhaps the wind blew and the baby fell out of the nest. But we wanna locate that original nest as best as we can. And if it's possible, we want to place that baby right back in that nest. Um, this is, we are sure that mom will find that baby there. If the original nest was destroyed, either the branch fell, the tree trimmers cut the branch without noticing the nest there, or even if your nest is intact, but now on the ground, um, the best option is to take a basket. Um, you want a basket because the water, the rain will drain through and the baby will not be stuck in a wet pool when it rains. And you wanna hang that basket as close to the site where the nest was. If you do not know where that nest was, you wanna make it directly above you in the tree where the tree branches fork, as you see in the picture on the slide. 
You're going to put your basket there with some ground and leaf litter and just play, place that nest in the tree. And now you are able to place that baby right back in that nest, that alternative nest. Either way, mom will be, should be able to fly and sit right on top of her baby as soon as you step down off your ladder. Uh, I've seen this happen where mom is waiting on the branch and as I'm coming down my ladder, mom is already sitting back down on her nest. Um, as I go back, as you see in that image below, that was actually a hanging basket. Somebody hung a basket with um, some chains and mom immediately came and sat in it. So uh, it's very successful. Um, and then once mom flies away with her babies, once the babies are old enough to fly away, you can remove that basket or you can leave it. She might even actually use it again next year. Okay, so for our uh, third most common nesters are our cavity nesters. This could be anything from woodpeckers um, to uh, screech at, eastern screech owls, as you see here. Uh, you will go with the same process as long as the babies are okay, you've observed, no, no blood is, observed, is on the babies, you can proceed with your re-nesting. Now, if you can find that nest again, and you are able to plop those babies back in, that is a great success. Often what happens is a tree trimmer comes down to remove a dead tree, either hit by lightning or disease, and they don't realize that that dead tree, that snag as it's called, uh, was home for some owls. Um, and when they cut the tree down, they realized that there was a nest in there. So. Uh, an alternative nest can be provided. Um, very simple plans online. You can purchase them. They're very easy to, to make. Um, and you see one in the image um, on our slide. Um, and all it is is a uh, box with a hole, a three inch diameter hole in one uh, on one side, and that's it. You place natural leaf litter in there. So you could put, pick up any of the natural leaf litter that is on the ground in your yard, at the park, or as in the image provided here, you can place some hay. <laughs> this way the babies have something soft to, to lay on and mom will maintain the nest uh, as she would normally. You would place that nest without the babies in it as high as possible. Typically the standard is six feet high. I understand that this can be very difficult for most of us. So we wanna make it as high as we possibly can so that other predators can't easily access it. Uh, place it there. Once that nest box is secure in that tree, then we are able to place those babies in that nest box. For this, what I would typically say is you have to wait 24 hours for proof that mom is there. A great way that you'll know mom is there is like in this image uh, that I took once. Um, she just kept, kept guard of her box, sat at the door as moms typically do, and she just slept there all, all day and kept, kept her baby's vigil. Um, another way that you can uh, be sure that mom has returned is that you can actually see at the bottom, uh, there will be new droppings there. Uh, mom will have fed the babies um, and she will be cleaning that nest box and there will be uh, fresh droppings at the bottom of that nest box. Um, within 24 hours, she should have fed her babies, flown in and out a couple of times, and you'll see the evidence without even disturbing the nest. If you do not see that evidence, you can just go back up your ladder, take a little peek in, Mom would be typically sleeping in there with her babies. If you disturb her and she flies away, she knows where her babies are. As soon as you go down off your ladder, she should come right back. So once you have attempted to reunite or re-nest a baby, um, you are going to continue with your observations. You are gonna observe some more. Step away, go inside, keep an eye out. This is a little bit harder with our nocturnals. 
Um, but for most of our species, they are during mom will be present during the daytime. So just keep an eye out, go inside, look out your window, look from your car. Uh, some people, you know, if they they have a security camera, they just point it to the, to the nest for a little while and they go back inside and, you know, they watch it from, from indoors. Look to see if your parent, the parent returns. Uh, for most birds, parents will return, sit at the nest, feed the babies. Uh, parents should return typically for most young birds within the first hour. Um, if you do not see that, keep on watching. Uh, if the baby starts to go quiet, starts putting its head down, difficult, you know, less and less reaction, other animals start coming over. Now you might want to get concerned and start uh, taking action. Uh, but typically, if you see mom flying in or you see fresh feces, fresh feces is a great sign that everything's going well, even if you're not seeing mom. So you can just keep an eye out for fresh feces. But what if mom does not return? Sometimes mom doesn't return, not because she's, you know, quit doing her job, but perhaps because something has happened. A uh, cat got mom, or maybe there was an accident. So you're going to want to make sure that if you are going to um, step in again, that you are going to keep that baby warm. Warmth is the first line of defense for helping that baby. You're going to keep that baby warm and you will not be feeding the baby. Like I said before, do not feed the baby. They're going to try to convince you, you will, you will stay strong and not feed the baby. And you wanna call immediately Pelican Harbor Seabird Station and get the directions on what you should do next. If the baby is in your care overnight, you wanna always keep it in a warm, dark, place in your home, away from your cats and your dogs. The smell or the presence of your pets may be very frightening to this baby. So you want to make sure, though your pets are very excited and curious about it, you want to keep them in a warm, dark place. So how do you keep that baby warm? How do you keep that baby contained? Most of us have not had uh, wildlife in our home. So if you do not have, um, anything, we all have a water bottle. So what I would say is heat up a water bottle and it should be warm to the touch and put a sock around it. Now you never want to put a heating element directly against the skin of anybody, of a baby or ourselves. So you want to wrap that water bottle in a sock or in a blanket. You can even do a rice bag, um, fill a sock with the rice, microwave it, and now it's a soft little warm heating element for that baby. You can also have a heating pad, a regular heating pad that you get from the pharmacy, and you can place that under the container, the box, the carrier that you have your baby in. If you have a cardboard box, they are great. You can use a cardboard box with an old t-shirt, an old linen. Um, Bundle that in to keep your baby nice and soft and warm, have a nice little touch to them and make sure your cardboard box has pre-cut out holes for your baby. This way you can keep the box closed, but your baby is secure and is able to have breathe. And ultimately, if you have a pet carrier of any size, those also work great. The heating pad or um, the water bottle or the rice bag will fit right, will work perfectly with that. Uh, your help definitely matters in, uh, in the situation. Last year, Pelican Harbor Station took an average of one patient every four hours. And for half of the, pa uh, for that, half of those patients were babies. So that was about, uh, one patient every eight hours was a baby that was admitted to Pelican Harbor. Not every baby needs rehabilitation care. Many babies are perfectly healthy and can be reunited with their parents. Um, so it is a great way to, to help wildlife from the comfort of your own space, from your home. Um, you are saving uh, Pelican Harbor countless hours of uh, staff, volunteer care, and resources. 
Okay, so I hope that was pretty helpful. Um, I am happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. I have my chat open if anybody wants to ask via chat. If not, um, you can unmute yourself and I'm happy to answer. So I got, does Pelican Harbor have the ability to pick up animals? Yes. <laughs> short, short, uh, answer. short answer. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, so we have two methods uh, of doing this um three actually so first method um we have an ambulance that our staff will go out um if they can if it's uh within like a couple miles radius um just because it is so important that our staff are in the clinic um then we'll be able to go out and rescue patients or transport them um second option we have an amazing group of volunteers called operation rescue and release uh, a couple of which i believe are on this webinar right now so we love you um, so these are specially trained volunteers uh, that have been taught how to properly contain and transport patients. So we will um, send out like a mass message to our group um, with the location, the species, the finders information, um, and our volunteers will go rescue uh, and transport them back to us. And our third method is if the animal is already contained um, and people usually get a kick out of this, but it uh, we can actually Uber the bird or the mammal, um, the patient, uh, around 10 or 15% of our intakes every year are actually transferred to us via Ubers. Um, and that's completely out of our pocket. Um, if anybody has any contacts at Uber, please send them my way because I've been <laughs> trying for a long time to get them to sponsor us somehow. Um, but yeah, those are our three, uh, three methods there of, of us being able to, to help um, transport and re-nest as well. Hi, I'm sorry for joining late. I found a baby bird this morning, but couldn't locate the nest. Is it best to take the bird to the station in this case? I don't have experience in baby bird care. Well, I wanna uh, say uh, thank you for trying to help that baby bird. Now, when it comes to the baby bird, it comes with a couple of factors. What kind of baby bird? Is it a raptor, a songbird, things of that nature? Uh, so I think what would be best is to to, well, I don't know if uh, anybody's available to talk about it right now, but to call and kind of uh, talk with somebody at Pelican Harbor about what kind of bird it is and how best to go about re-nesting it. Yes. You know, Sandra, I'm going to direct message you my number right now. Um, you can send me some pictures and we can chat and try to find the best solution. I also did not mention um, Elise Turns, a little picture of a little guy down here of Elise Turn, one of my beloved animals. Um, Elise Turns are a little different than all the other birds, but you will want to make sure that you're always contacting, contacting if you find this little treasure. Um, call, don't touch, call first. Um, these guys nest on gravel and rocks. They used to nest up and down the shoreline of South Flo of Florida. But as we started moving on to our beaches and uh, living on the coastline, they uh, relocated to gravel rooftops. And in recent years, gravel rooftop, rooftops have been um, changed to tar rooftops. So we're seeing um, more nesting in some area and less nesting in other areas. So these are very protected little birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of them um, over in Doral. Actually, a couple of years ago, we uh, received a call that um, there was a, a clothing company warehouse in Doral that was doing maintenance on their roof on their AC. Um, saw these birds up there and the contractor took it upon himself to remove these birds from he thought that he was going to be so helpful over the edge of the building. Um, so thankfully someone contacted us um, and we were able to, you know, get the authorities involved and get those birds back up there um, with a stern, stern uh, warning and, yeah. you know, uh, knowledge that that is a criminal offense since these are all protected birds, but least terns in particular um, are actually a threatened species in the state of Florida as well. So They're very protected. Yeah, extra, extra important to, to keep them happy and safe. But yes. Well, it seems like we've run out of questions. Uh, Julie, can you hear me? This is yes. Michael Quinn. Okay, Hi. great. Yeah. Um, so I, I do have a question. For, first, mm -hmm. thanks for a, a really nice presentation. 
Thank you. Um, I, I was wondering how you guys deal with um, rehabbing uh, birds in this case that are migratory. Um, how long do you decide to hold on to the birds and how do you know when to release That's them? Great, and if they question. are migratory, how, how does, how do you kind of integrate them back into their, you know, natural <laughs> well, that is a very comp. That's a very complex answer to your question. So, very in, good question, uh, very observant question. So, it really depends on a lot of factors. Now, are we talking about a baby? So, like these least turns, they do migrate down here for nesting. Um, so, if you are able to raise the baby in its natural state, which, and then they can, you can raise it and rehabilitate it. To, for it to migrate with its colony, which uh, we have done, then then that's great. You raise it, you you get it ready for migration, you flight condition it, and then you rejoin it to its colony. Um, since they're a co colony species, they're very accepting. So you bring it back to its original site and it's accepted back into its colony, especially for lease terns. They are so, um, as we mentioned, they are so heavily protected that there is a team of people literally watching that one guy. Uh, there, there are people there with binoculars day and night watching, making sure that that bird is accepted back in and that migrates out with the whole colony. Um, if it is an adult patient that comes down, um, you know, it's migrating down here and it gets hurt in Florida and it takes a long time, you know, perhaps the bones didn't heal or maybe it got injured on the way back north. Um, and its colony has, has now moved on. Um, what happens often is the network of rehabbers are, is, a, is a phenomenal network. Um, you find out where uh, the closest colony is, where the closest rehabilitation team is there, and you, you coordinate with them. You see, okay, uh, I can transport this bird to here. Can you come here? And you, you switch off that bird, or if you're lucky enough to have the resources and the staff capacity, Maybe a staffer will take the bird all the way up to where the closest colony is and introduce it to that colony to migrate back north. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, that, that's really cool. So it's thanks. Complex, for I know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, yeah, it was a, it's a, the animals are complex. So the answer is third always, option. it depends. Yeah, that's always the answer. <laughs> yeah. And there's also a third option. Sometimes it takes so long to rehab that you're just at the migratory window again. So you just hold on to it. Okay. Because yeah, now they're coming back down. Yeah, that's that's kind of. So you just right. send them back with the guys going back down. Right. <laughs> and, and and if you don't mind, I don't want to um, take up everybody's time, but I do have one more question. Um, you, yeah. you were saying, um, you, you know, about the influence of weather on whether yeah. or not to, um, you know, to help inform your decision about whether or not to re-nest or mm -hmm. try to do rehab. I, I was wondering, you, you guys, first of all, you do incredible work and, and certainly you have a lot of data about, you know, your incoming patients and outgoing patients. I, I wonder if you guys have ever looked at whether or not you see an uptick in the number of patients you have before a storm like a hurricane hits. Now, it makes sense that you would have a lot of patients coming in during or after the storm. But, you know, these animals have an uncanny ability to kind of sense things we can't. And I just wonder if you guys have ever looked at, at the patient rate uh, before a, a storm, which may indicate that animals are sensing something's coming and, and may abandon um, their position. Well, I love data. So you hit mm -hmm. a couple points that I love. I love numbers. I love data. I love crunching the numbers just for fun. So uh, before the storm, there really, it's kind of is a little bit of a lull before the storm, whether or not it's because the humans, you know, us, we're busy running around prepping for our homes that we're not out in the parks and things like that, noticing as much, but there is a bit of a lull right before a storm. And there is a huge uptake after a storm, all the trees come down, things like that. Um, so there is a, a lull and then there's a storm. So there's nothing. And then there's an uptake and I'm talking about a huge storm, like a hurricane, things like that. Um, there are weather patterns. Um, sometimes there are, there was a case, Oof, gosh, I might be aging myself now. Around 2019, I think. I think it's 2019. Uh, there was lar uh, two large storms off the coast um, in about Feb December, February. I can't remember exactly the time window. Um, 
And it blew the Gannet colony that was migrating south from the Canada region. They just happened to be around Florida when those storms were blowing. And we ha- our beaches were covered with Gannets, northern Gannets. Mm-hmm. We in Florida didn't really feel any wind, but off the shoreline, there was a, a, a immense amount of wind and it just blew those migratory birds to us. So weather does play a huge factor. Yeah, the same thing happened with um, Corey's shear waters in oh, 2017. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, the Corey's shear water, yes. Yeah. People were calling saying, there's penguins on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, the, the, the question actually came from um, uh, probably something that's dating me as well, but there was a, a massive tsunami, I'm sure we all remember in, I think it's Sri Lanka. Oh, um, yes. Like yeah. a, about a decade ago or maybe mm-hmm. a little bit longer now. But, you know, they said there was an um, incredible amount uh, or, or lack of animals who became victim to that. Yeah, I know, remember them saying that, yeah. The, and, on Christmas, right? It was Christmas. Yes, exactly. And so it's, you know, clearly these animals kind of knew what was going on and uh, I had a better perspective on things than, than us humans. And so I, I just wonder if maybe if you guys saw that in, in your data. But, but as you say, uh, your data is also dependent on humans. Um, yes bringing the animals in. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's hard to disentangle these two uh, variables. Very interesting though. It's a great question. Um, so if you have a, a bird that makes an inconvenient nest, like in a, one of my neighbors had a Mardi Gras uh, decoration and the bird made a nest right in her front door. And it's not really convenient because the doors open all the time. And she thought it was dangerous. Uh, what is kind of the best thing to do? Should you relocate the nest? Should you just relocate your, your, um, entryway through into your house to a diff the back door um what's what's generally accepted to do so it really like everything in wildlife it really <laughs> depends <laughs> so some birds don't nest very long um like you see this guy down here the yellow crown night heron he doesn't really sit in his nest for very long kind of has a tiny little nest for a little while and then he's a brancher for a long time um so it really depends on the baby nest, you know, the baby situation, how long it's going to take that baby to fledge. It's always best to leave the nest there. That is always my advice. Yeah. Um, yes, it's inconvenient for you. Once those babies have fledged, you are welcome to remove the nest, remove the inconvenience, put, close up the hole, put up a barrier. Uh, but it's always best to leave the baby there, the nest there. I know it's an inconvenience sometimes. The, the nest is, like you said, right at the doorway. But if mom chose that spot, she knows the door is opening. She's aware of the situation. She flew back and forth a bunch of times. She, she's aware of it, so she's okay with it. It's us that maybe are, are inconvenienced by it. And if you're able to use another door or just be okay with it for just a, sometimes even just a couple of weeks, to maybe a couple of months, and then and then you could just break it down, and it, it'll most likely never happen again. Does that I hope that answers. Well, there was question, no Susan. there were no babies in this nest. Did you, yeah, there were no babies in this nest. So if it there's no eggs and, and no so baby, she, if there's no right. eggs and no babies, you can relocate it. But like I said, it's right. you know it's inconveniencing you. If the worry is about the animal, the animal sure. chose it. They are comfortable with it. They they understand the, the situation. And you might not see the convenience sure. in it, but maybe they do. You know, maybe it's close to the food source that's going to help the baby. Okay. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. If that's all, thank you, Susan. I agree. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Julie. Oh, thank you. I know you're all on mute, but I'm sure you're clapping in the background (laughs) as well. (laughs) Well, I'm clapping for you guys for coming and for participating and for being involved with wildlife. We need we need more wildlife advocates like you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, And if for whatever reason you have never come by and visited us at Pelican Harbor, um, please feel free to do so. We're open every single day of the year. Um, We have free audio tours in the back. You can see some of our patients. If you're lucky, meet some of our ambassador animals if they're out. Um, And it's a really, really great little stop um, if you're ever looking for something to do. (laughs) Well, thank you so much and have a great day.